Take your Bible, if you would, and turn over to the book of 1 John, and go to 1 John chapter 2. Now, several weeks now, we've looked into 1 John, and we ended this last thought, the first part of this chapter, of course, he's speaking here to believers clearly, reminds them of the work of Christ, and even some, some evidences, he writes now and says, you know, you need to keep the commandments and Certainly nobody who has, no, or anyone who has no interest in the commandments of God is not his child. But then he goes back and he addresses the children. We sort of finished up last time with this exhortation to love not the world. In verse 15, it says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in, in him. Now you know in the Bible, when you see the word world, you have to place it in context. Um, you can go back, of course, and look at the original language. There's two different words that are world, but you don't need that. If you look in the context, it's evident when God says, God so loved the world. And then over here, he says, love not the world. Well, there's not a conflict in the Bible, but you simply take the Bible and let it interpret itself. When we read in uh, 2 Corinthians 4 that the devil is the God of this world. Well, he's not, he didn't create anybody. He's not the God over mankind, but he is the God over a system. You see, the world can mean the earth, the inhabited earth. The Caesar sent out a, a proclamation to all the world. Well, it was the inhabited earth, the Roman Empire. When God so loved the world, he's talking about all the population, not just at that particular time, but all time. And then, of course, when it talks about this part of the world that we're not to love, it is talking about a system. Now, it's real easy. If you don't understand it from a theological standpoint, certainly you can understand it from a political standpoint. Do we not live in a system that is anti-God? I mean, it does, not just in the United States. Anywhere in the world you go, the devil has a system. Now, that system has been given to him. Do you remember when uh, Jesus went up to the top of the mount from the devil tempted him first of all in the wilderness, then he took him up to, the, to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Now at that time, there was only one kingdom on the earth. That was the Roman Empire. He didn't just show him the Roman Empire. He showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Now that was this world system. And he said, all of this I will give you for it is delivered unto me. Now, Jesus didn't say, well, how can you give me something you don't have? He did have it. The devil is over the kingdoms of this world. But there's one kingdom that he is not over, and that is the final kingdom, the eternal kingdom, and that's the kingdom that Jesus is going to sit on the throne. Now, the world is a system, and the devil is over that system. And he says, we're not to love the world. You know, Jesus prayed in John 17 about the world. He talked about, uh, you're in, I pray for them, not that thou wouldest take them out of the world, but that you would keep them from the evil. See, in a sense, if I can look at it in, a, in just sort of a vernacular type way, it's almost like God is saying, all right, devil, I've given you the world. You're pretty much running things. You've got free reign. Now, let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to put my people in it, and you're not going to do anything about it. The gates of hell are not going to keep them back. They are going to go into your domain and win people to Jesus. The gospel invades his domain. But now, is there not the temptation for us as believers to not go in and, and overtake it, but to be affected by it? That's what he's warning against. We've got to live in it. Don't think for a moment that it won't influence you. And now, there's a term we... Uh, sort of create the term, but it's certainly biblical. There is such thing as a worldly Christian. You know, that's what the Bible says over in Romans chapter 12, be not conformed to this world. Now, he's not saying don't be conformed to the earth. Some of you who eat too much are conformed to the earth. You're getting rounder all the time. Okay, he didn't mean that. He meant, uh-oh, I'm stepping on toes. But anyway, uh, he said, don't be conformed to the system. So what does the system look like? Well, for all, in verse 16, that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Do you know 
when the devil tempted Eve, now he runs the system, so this makes sense. When he came and he tempted Eve, he tempted her with the lust of the flesh. It's good for food. You eat. Flesh is, or lust is just simply taking a legitimate desire and twisting it. It's just right to eat, but it wasn't right to eat that fruit. So the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, she saw that it was good for food. Before she ever touched it, it was appealing to the eye as she contemplated what it would be like. That's the lust of the eyes. I don't have it, and I won't be satisfied till I get it. And then the pride of life. I want to be number one. I want to be noticed. You look at our world, and if that doesn't sum up the world, let me, let me tell you what is remarkable about the Bible. The Bible addresses every known issue to man concerning life and living and death and human nature. There's no subject it doesn't cover. It absolutely covers it. And it's, try to pick out something that's in this world that's not the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And I mean in this world system. Not everything that's good about the world, but everything that's evil. Anywhere you want to go, that's what controls man. But it says in verse 17, the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now, with that foundation in mind, understanding there's a world system, I go a little bit farther down, and I notice here in verse 18, he says, little children. Now, remember, there's two aspects to little children in the book of uh, 1 John. Look back to verse 12 for a moment. He says, I write unto you little children. Now, that's talking about all born-again people, little technons, little born, the born ones, because your sins are forgiven. But then he addresses in verse 13, the very last phrase, I write unto you little children, because you have known the Father. Now, all of them were considered children in that they were born again, but now he's becoming specific, talking about young in the faith. That's the word right here in verse 18. You young in the faith children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know it is the last time. You ever heard anybody say we're living in the last time? Well, we are. Ever since Jesus ascended back to heaven, we have been. We're in the last part of this age. See, a day is with a thousand years is with the Lord. And so we're in the last part of this age, and there's nothing that needs to happen for Jesus to come back and take his church. But what happens when he does? The Antichrist is going to be revealed. Now, little children, it's the last time, and you've heard that Antichrist shall come. And he will. During the tribulation, there will be an individual that God calls the Antichrist. But in the meantime, there are many Antichrists, whereby we know it is the last time. I want you to hold your finger right here, if you would, and go back to 2 Thessalonians for a moment. And if I were to look in the epistles, there's probably not a, a passage in the epistles that more explains the Antichrist in this passage in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You understand the people in Thessalonica, they thought that the coming had already taken place. They, there was a lot of persecution taken on, and they think, well, surely the, uh, Jesus, uh, or they were mixed up on when he would come, but surely the, the tribulation is on us, and all of these bad things are happening. And he says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Now, what is that day? Well, it's the day of the Lord, um, the beginning of uh, the culmination of all of the, the end of the age. That day is not going to come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, the man of sin. That's the Antichrist. He says that isn't going to happen until there's a falling away. He says in verse 4 again, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now you see that played out in Revelation 13 with the beast out of the uh, earth who sits on the throne and, and blasphemes God. Remember ye not that when I was with you I told you these things. Now ye know... What withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time? 
Now, what is it that withholds them? You know, it's the, the uh, church being on this earth. In other words, the Antichrist cannot operate until the church is gone. We are withholding him. Why are we withholding him? Because the Holy Spirit lives in the church. It is the Holy Ghost that is holding back. I mean, what else would the devil be waiting for? I mean, the devil's got him ready. All I got to do is just let me have my rope, and, and God will hold him back as long as he wants to. But when the church is gone, nothing is there to withhold. He shows up. You say, well, man, that's good. I don't have to see the Antichrist. I don't have to know who he is. If I'm a born-again believer, I'm going to be raptured out. You say, well, we could watch it from heaven, but why in the world would I want to watch that when I'm in heaven? I'd rather just be concerned about what's going on up there. And after I get used to the sparkle for a couple of years, and uh, all, all of a sudden, oh, the seven years is already up. Uh, it's time to eat. I mean, you know, it's about how quick it'll be. So he's going to be withheld. So you might, as a Christian, say, well, that's just you know, that's prophecy. It's in the future. I certainly don't have to worry about it. But notice this. It says in verse 7, this is what he's saying to these Christians in the first century. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth or hindereth will hinder until he be taken out of the way. The mystery of iniquity is already working. Now, what is the mystery of iniquity? Well, it's related to whatever this Antichrist is going to do in a massive way. That's the mystery of iniquity, but it already is working. Now, that's related to our passage in 1 John. Go back over to 1 John and go back to chapter 2. And notice verse 18, little children, it is the last time, as you have heard, that Antichrist shall come even now. There are many antichrists, whereby we know it is the last time. Now, there's two aspects of this, but one aspect is the spirit of antichrist. There is a spirit of antichrist in the world, and we're not talking about just some religious leader. Now, many of you are familiar with uh, Jim Jones back in, I guess, the 70s, something like that. Uh, there was a David Koresh back in the 90s, um, other men that we could mention uh, the Moonies. I don't know if that guy's still uh, still living or not, or if they're still selling flowers, but I mean, he had a big following. Many of these people claim to be the Messiah. I mean, they're, they're not just starting a Christian religion. They actually claim, I am the chosen one, the coming. Now, literally, they would be anti-Christ in that they would be against Christ. So you could include that, but there's something far more subtle than that. Only a I don't know, 1,000, 1,500 people followed Jim Jones. Only a handful of folks followed the Koresh guy. Now, Mooney, he had a bunch of followers. Uh, not the masses of population are not affected by that. But you know what the devil does that affects the masses of population is there is the spirit of Antichrist. Now, if you understand this, I guess you don't come, become as frustrated because God said, this is how it's going to be. He's in control. He knows it's taking place. You know as well as I do, you, you could cry from the housetops, you can scream at the television like I do sometimes. I mean, you know that if in, in a classroom today, if a teacher decided we're going to take six weeks and we're going to study the Muslim religion, and at the end of the six weeks, they end up having, they put a prayer cloth down and may all the students get on the prayer cloth and pray, if nobody, I mean, they'd probably get by with it. I mean, you know, well, they're just teaching these people something. They're not trying to make Muslims out of them. They're just trying to give them an experience or whatever. I mean, if you had a problem with that, they'd look at you like some stick in the mud. Oh, what in the world? Come on. They're just trying to be. But if you had a teacher to even say, we're going to study biblical Christianity, and we're not even going to put down a prayer rug. I'm just going to explain to you the tenets of Christianity. There would be so many lawsuits and an uproar. You say, well, man, that doesn't seem fair. Both are, so, you know, so-called a faith. We understand one actually happens to be true. But even if you looked at it as an outsider, you'd say, well, that's not fair. Why? Because the mystery of iniquity doth already work. You, you realize we've got an internet out there. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, whatever it might be, and the internet per se, the whole thing. Now, some of them have some basic rules, but I'm going to use Twitter as an example. Twitter has basically no rules. I mean, it's, it's, a, 
a no holds barred type site, you want to put it on there, you can put it on there. It might have to agree that you're 18 or put a warning. But without being explicit, I'm going to tell you what it has on it is explicit. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's there. There's no rules. I mean, anything goes except if you wanted to put something they don't agree with. Then they'll, they'll stop it. Now, I'm not saying this for political purposes, though I agree with the point. You know, somebody gets up and, they, and, and the president of the United States makes a statement on that thing, and you don't happen to agree with his political position. Now, if the political position happened to line up with killing babies and homosexuality and everything against this Bible, it'd be fine. But if he were to make any kind of reference to, to something that goes along with the Bible or God or something that we think, oh, as Christians, man, I kind of like that, watch out. It causes an uproar. I mean, you can put cuss words, pornography, anything you want, but you try to push, push too much Bible. Oh, now there's platforms that the Bible goes through, but there's been uh, stuff taken off of YouTube. There's been stuff taken down because they didn't like that it was coming from a biblical perspective. Now, much of it is allowed. I mean, we're on YouTube tonight. We're, I mean, that's not completely shut down, but you know that the mystery of iniquity doth already work. I mean, it's there. It's in the background. You need not get frustrated about it. You needn't say, man, i got to change that. No, you're not going to. You just preach the gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The devil try as he might with every bit of force and angst that he can go after it. He can't stop the gospel. People still get saved. Now, John says, look, the Antichrist is here. But then he describes not just the spirit of Antichrist, but actually the evidence that there are many of them. These are talking about actual people. Now look at verse 19. Now think too, we're not but one, oh, probably 70 or 80 years past Jesus ascending back to heaven now. The church, I mean, this is the first generation of Christians. Some of them are older, but they're just not very far into it. In verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Now, there's a spirit of Antichrist in the world. That's the spirit of the world, the mystery of iniquity. But really the focus here is specific teachers that take that same idea, mystery of iniquity. See, politically... And, and you see this play out in the book of, of Revelation. There's a political Babylon and there is a religious Babylon. Starting back all the way at the Tower of Babel. Politically, yes, anti-God, anti-Bible, and ecumenical. Now, there's no problem with being Bible and God as long as you're ecumenical. You put it all together under one, they're fine with that. What they have a problem with, one way to heaven one book and the exclusion of all others, that's what they have a problem with because that's, the danger, that's what the devil knows is a danger to him. Politically, that's what they oppose. Now, religiously, the spirit of Antichrist is, oh yes, we're uh, Christian and we, we, everybody's a Christian and we're all the children of God and, and they, the biggest enemy that God has is religion. See, everybody's incurably religious. Very few people claim to be an atheist. And even those that do, they hate somebody they don't even believe exists. I mean, they're not really atheists. They're just bitter. People are incurably religious. They're going to worship something. So the devil will give them something to worship. So what he's warning here is, look, you know that these, and he's talking to baby Christians, those that haven't been saved that long or aren't that far along spiritually, he says, watch it. You're going to listen to this person, and you're going to scratch your head. Now, you've heard this happening before, right? Somebody says, well, this guy was a preacher. He was in the ministry. I mean, he was, you know, just right down the line, and now he's gone off, and he's a Jehovah's Witness. Well, you say, was he saved? Don't ask me. Read the Bible. It says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. If they had have been of us they would no doubt have continued with us. You see, that, a person who's founded on the rock is not going to be 
swayed by false religion. They can be confused. They can get mixed up. But they're not going to deny the faith. They're not going to come and say, well, there's a new way. You know, here's somebody who maybe grows up in a fundamental Bible-believing church. Uh, Maybe they're a preacher themselves or a preacher's kid or uh, the deacon's son or whoever it might be. And they leave the church and they go off to a college and the college teaches them that the Bible's not the Word of God. Jesus is not the Son of God. That, you know, there's many ways to heaven or whatever it might be. Just throws that out and they come back and they become liberal in their thinking. I mean liberal in the sense literally. I don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. I don't think Jesus is the Son of God. You say, well, man, they must have lost it. They didn't lose it. They never had it. That don't mean they can't get it. They could still be saved, but they're not, they're not saved people who became liberal and thinking there's no Bible, no God. If they went out, they went out because they were not of us. Now, this is what he's getting at genuine salvation, being genuinely born again. I can get mixed up. I can believe something that's not exactly right. Now, I, you know, I don't at all doctrinally believe some of the things that some churches teach. Um, for instance, I don't believe what the Church of God believes about tongues. Now, there's a danger, and I don't want to get too far afield on this, but there's a danger that when you get up and you teach that the gift of the Holy Spirit is the evidence of salvation, and you so put that pressure on people that they think, boy, I've got to speak in tongues, or that means I'm not saved, then a lot of times people just think, because I gibbered something, I'm saved. There's a danger to that. But if you read their doctrinal statement, they believe Jesus is the only way to heaven, Therefore, I would expect probably there's some genuinely saved people in the church of God. Matter of fact, I've met some. Don't agree with their doctrine on tongues at all. And it, and it does lead to some way out, far out stuff. So there may be a lot of lost people in those churches. But frankly, there's some saved people in there. But they're, they're confused. But they're not liberal in the sense they don't believe Jesus is the Son of God. They don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. They haven't rejected those fundamentals They're just mixed up on certain doctrine. You can be mixed up, but if you don't have the fundamentals down, I don't have to scratch my head and wonder what happened. You never were born again on the authority of the Bible. So he says, don't get confused. They went out because they were not of us. That's the spirit of Antichrist. First of all, they depart. Well, then they also lie. Now, you know, when I'm I'm describing this, and you may have in your mind just Joe Church member who sat in a church, he was lost, you know, he went off and got educated out of his faith, so-called, comes back, now he's liberal in his thinking. Yes, he needs to be saved, but that's not really the antichrist that they're talking about. This antichrist is a person who is propagating this. He is going after people. Now, notice it says in verse uh, 22, who is a liar, but he that denieth Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist. All right, you want to know who these Antichrists are? They deny that Jesus is the Christ. That he that denieth, uh, he is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Now, when you say Jesus is the Christ, there's a lot in that. First of all, Jesus is his human name. You know what Jesus means? Savior. Name him Jesus, he'll save his people from his sin. Christ is the Messiah, the anointed one. If you don't believe everything about this, I mean, there's several aspects of this. First of all, that Jesus, the human son of God, God and man, is the anointed Messiah that God sent. You're an anti-Christ. You're against him. Jesus said, if you're not for me, you're against me. So if if you're not right about Jesus then you're not right about anything religiously. Doesn't matter else what else you believe. You know, we often talk about, and I'm not trying to be critical. I'm just making the point that the Bible is, is making here. We talk about Judeo-Christian values. Now, we got a lot in common with Jews and their background because we believe the Old Testament. But you understand a Jewish person who is Orthodox, who does not believe, I mean, they may believe the Old Testament. They may be highly moral. They may have a lot of in common with our, with our background. They believe in the Ten Commandments. They might even fight for, uh, of course, most uh, Jews are political liberals, but let's say an Orthodox Jew believed a whole lot like we did. He's missing out on the main point. Jesus is the Son of God. 
He is the Messiah. There is no other way to heaven. That's what John is saying. You deny the Father and the Son. There is no way to the Father but the Son. You deny that, doesn't matter what else you believe, how orthodox you might be. Um, and again, I'm not saying this to be critical. I'm just making the point. I don't think I'm slandering. I'm going to tell you a Jehovah's Witness. Do you know the big emphasis they make in their assemblies is, of course, going out knocking on doors and studying. They put a big emphasis on uh, look at pass these passages and search them out and so forth. And, of course, the ones they want you to read. But they miss. In other words, they would, they would believe a lot of things similar but they miss the most important thing. They don't believe Jesus is Jehovah. Listen, I'm a Jehovah's witness, okay? Don't put me in context, though. I, I want a witness for Jehovah. You know who Jehovah is? The Lord Jesus Christ. And I could get off real quick and, and prove that to you from the Bible. Um, Jesus is Jehovah. If you miss that, you've missed it. The Mormons... They'll brag on the Bible. Let them come to your door. Oh, yes, we believe the Bible. Oh, we also have, you know, the Book of Mormon. But, hey, I mean the Bible. Yeah, let's talk about it. Let's look at it. We, we believe all this stuff. And they, they're right along with you. You think they're a Sunday school teacher that could teach in a Baptist church as far as their terminology sounds very similar. But get them right down to it. Who is the Lord Jesus Christ? Who is he? Well, um, yeah, I think he's died on a cross for your sin and so forth. I mean, he happens to be the brother of Satan. And he's just one of God's, you know, children that he gave birth to at some point. And you can be a God yourself. I mean, it's way out stuff, but it all centers because they miss out on who Jesus is. The Antichrist. They're religious Antichrist. Now, we're not just talking about cults. Uh, the most dangerous ones, it might be some denomination I could mention. I'll tell you, I'll just, since I'm a Baptist, I'll just say, hey, it could be a Baptist preacher. And believe me, this exists, and it used to be even worse. Plenty of Baptist preachers came out of their cemeteries, and they didn't believe that the, the Bible was the inerrant Word of God. They did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. A famous Southern Baptist uh, teacher, Nels Foray, who was well-known back in the day, wrote a book and said that Jesus was, was the product of a, a German regiment that was close to Jerusalem around 2,000 years ago. Mary probably wandered out and found this German res, you know, regiment, and he was a blonde, uh, probably had blonde roots and so forth. I mean, this is a book written by a Southern Baptist that got up and lectured in Southern Baptist churches, and, and of course, not, not good ones, but these men would have him in because Dr. Foray is coming to, to speak. And, of course, as a result of that, you know what you got? Independent Baptist churches. They said, we're not being part of that. We're getting out of here. Now, I'm just saying it doesn't matter what the label is. If you're not right about Jesus, that's the anti-Christ against Christ. So they depart, they lie, and then finally they seduce. These things have I written unto you, verse 26. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. Now, let me tell you where the Antichrist, false teacher, spirit of the devil, who's, who the devil, look, they might not even realize they're pawns in the devil's hand. They didn't have a, 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 a seance and the devil got with the devil and said, how can I serve you best? They just are human beings who are deceived and they're going about who knows what their motive is. That's not for me to determine. I just know what the end result is. They're Antichrist and they seduce. You know what? Uh, the job of the church is. The job of the church is to go out into the world and reach lost people with the gospel. That's our job. So now, our church, when we think of our church expanding, uh, that's going to that's going to be a, a, a several ways that's going to happen. Christians that are looking for a place to grow, yes, that's going to that's part of it. A Christian comes, they're looking for a place to grow, but to grow to do what? to grow, that they might go out and reach the lost. You know what the Antichrist does? They just simply want to go get Christians that are not well-grounded and just get a group of mixed-up Christians, and that's, that's who they go after. They seduce. Their whole focus is to proselytize. Their whole focus is to seduce. They're not looking at a lost world. How could they? They're part of it. They're just saying, you know, the best candidate that we could get to come after our cult would be somebody who knows just enough Bible to get them in trouble. 
I mean, they don't go out and reach just people that are way off on left field. They know they grew up in Sunday school, grew up with a little bit of church, and they're disgruntled. That's who we're going after. They seduce. And that's what the Antichrist does. So the spirit of Antichrist and the evidence of Antichrist. Now, we're not going to get there tonight, um, but he shows us in this same chapter how the Christian, how the little children don't really have to be concerned about it because God has given us his spirit. And his spirit can combat far greater anything that the devil can throw at us. Let's go ahead and stop there tonight. Lord, how we thank you for the word of God tonight. And we thank you that even though the devil is a seducer, and even though he's anti-Christ, Jesus lives in our heart in the person of the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us tonight to be faithful to this book you've given us, faithful to the truth. Help us tonight to stand on uh, what it is that makes us uh, sound in the faith. Lord, we pray that you'd help us to have a burden for those that are around us. In Jesus' name, amen. 534 is the song tonight. We'll sing a stanza of 534 and we'll be dismissed. Mm -hmm. 